This video looks at generalized predictive control type approaches with state space models. So far then in this chapter we've focused mainly on Karima models because this is what was common in the early literature on generalized predictive control. However, it's also clear that Karima models do not extend very well or neatly to the multiverbal case. So you might say, well, in order to generalize, perhaps I now want to look at state space models. Unfortunately, you cannot simply replace one model with another, as there are some subtleties, and you will have seen that in chapter one when we looked at predictions, and in particular, unbiased predictions. So this video is going to propose one alternative way of <coughs> basically using state space models with generalized predictive control. But I'm going to emphasize here, you need to remember that MPC is a way of thinking. There is not a single algorithm. So you are free to modify this as it fits your own requirements. Some baseline assumptions then. The first set of videos in the MPC series set out the foundations we needed. We need unbiased predictions, and we're focusing on open loop predictions for now. So in the state space case, we said they took a form a bit like this. Y hat future equals PX X hat plus HX U hat. And we'll go back to that in a minute. We needed the use of an unbiased cost. And a typical cost might be some of error squared, differences between the input and the steady state squared, and changes in the input squared. Now, with Karima models, the cost was typically based on control increments because that fell out neatly with the model. However, when you're using state space models, it's actually far easier to use the input deviations rather than the input increments. And so that tends to be more common. But of course, you can do whatever you like, whatever serves your needs. Deviation variables. The reader is reminded that these are defined relative to, and here's a key word, the expected steady state. So implicitly, the values assume a best estimate of the system disturbances. And of course, you need to know what the target is. So we did things like this. We said, assume that the steady state value of the out output gets to the target. And using our model parameters, the steady state value of the output is given by this formula here. C times XSS, where X is the steady state state, plus your disturbance estimate. And of course, your main dynamics are given by the steady state value of the state equals some matrix A times the steady state value of the state plus some matrix B times the steady state value of the input. Clearly, this is a simplistic model. Now, you can use these equations in order to solve for the steady state value of the state and the input. And from that, define our deviation variables, which is the distance of the state and the input from their steady state values. And if you then substitute those in, you find you get an underlying state space model like this. The deviation of the state um, basically follows the dynamics AX plus BU. Now, we, that was covered in chapter one, so I've said that fairly quickly. Now, if you use deviation variables, then what you'll find is you can say the future values of the output or the future values of the error, it's going to be the same in this case, are given by PX times X hat K plus HX times u hat k. And of course, that was done in the first video series, so we're not going to go through that. There is a bit of a note here that we're going to assume that the future target is constant for now, because to do otherwise does make things slightly more complicated. The performance index we're going to use, sum of future errors with some weighting q if you want it, and sum of squares of future deviations in the input from the steady state, again with some weighting r, which you can choose as you please. Now the error is given by the distance of the output from the target, and what you'll notice is we've said that in essence e equals y hat in this particular case because of how we defined y hat. If I substitute <coughs> my predictions up here into my performance index, then I'm going to get something like this. And again, I'm not going to dwell on that because that's exactly the same as we did in the earlier videos in this series. Next, what I need to do is minimize with respect to the future control 
deviations. So I'm differentiating now with respect to u hat future and I set grad j equals zero. Again, that's the same as in earlier videos and you'll get a formula a bit like this, which if you want to look at that slowly, please pause the video and do so. I can now solve that in order to get u hat future with some simple algebra and this is what I get, that my future input deviations are given by this formula h transpose qh plus r all inverse times h transpose q px times x hat. Obviously what we normally do in predictive control is take just the first value and therefore I'm going to multiply by this e1 transposed vector which extracts the first value from u future. Finally I want to rewrite in terms of the actual state and the actual input rather than using deviation variables. Now you'll notice that this was u hat and this at the end was x hat. So all I've done is where I had u hat I've written uk minus uss and where I had x hat I've written xk minus xss. And now I can see the control law in the original domain. Just a reminder that you need to calculate xss and USS and the formula you use to calculate them are these ones here. You'll notice then that this predictive control law what it reduces to is state feedback. A simple state feedback matrix the K which links the input deviations with the state deviations. The integral action comes about because you're constantly updating the estimates for the steady state using these equations here. Where are the closed loop poles then? As your control law takes the form of a simple state feedback, the closed loop poles can be determined using some simple algebra. My model, y equals cx plus d, x equals ax plus bu, and my control law, uk minus uss equals minus k, xk minus xss. But you remember that we've already showed the way you estimate your steady state values, this equation here follows x minus xss equals a, x minus xss plus b into u minus uss. So what I can do for now, just for the analysis, is just combine these two equations. And if I do that, I get this equation down here at the bottom. And clearly, you can see that I've got a simple closed loop dynamic a minus b. Therefore, the algebra and the pole computation are much simpler with state-space models, um, especially for the MIMO case. If you remember all of the algebra we had to do with the Karima models to work out the closed-loop poles, and here they dropped out almost by inspection. However, there are a few subtleties. If you're using state-space methods, you need a state estimate. The control law was based upon a state estimate and where's that going to come from? You're going to need an observer and when you add in your observer that's going to include additional complexity and dynamics. Now many um, introductory courses on predictive control and in fact many papers in the literature ignore the observer and any complexity and dynamics that go with that but in reality if you're going to implement this it's something you cannot ignore. And here's the problem a poor state estimate will imply that your predictions are misleading and hence your control law could also be misleading and very poor during transients and indeed you will see that that if you set up a simulation where it's necessary to include the observer explicitly and you start with a poor estimate of the initial state then during the initial transients your control can be quite poor.